Organic trace minerals come in many types and formulations, leading to confusion about chemistry, terminology, and methodologies. With Balchem's Keysher line of chelated minerals, we provide superior performance and exceptional value by keeping it simple. Binding minerals to the highest quality plant protein-derived amino acids and peptides in our world-class production facilities using a true chelation process pioneered by Balchem and trusted in both the human and animal arenas for nearly 60 years. The Keysher line delivers proven and consistent bioavailability to maximize performance and a no-frills pricing approach for greater profitability. Visit BalchemANH.com to see how Keysher chelated minerals are your link to superior performance and exceptional value. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing at Balchem. Today, we're stepping back to take a look at the marketplace from a consumer's perspective. Over the last two years, we've seen so many changes in our lives. The pandemic disrupted almost every aspect of the consumer packaged goods industry and changed the way we all react to our surroundings. IRI is one of the original innovators in big data and now integrates the world's largest set of consumer data points to help industry professionals make important business decisions. Today, we'll learn about the opportunities that can be found in these changing times. I would now like to introduce Melissa Rodriguez. Ms. Rodriguez has been part of the IRI team for over 17 years, engaging and energizing clients uh, for growth across multiple facets of the food chain. As a principal in Client Insights, she is a trusted advisor to her clients, assisting with consumer-focused and consumer-centric data analytics to drive business decisions. She also participates in many IRI relationships with industry associations, including IDDBA and NAMI, and her insights have been, uh, appeared on webinars, blogs, and several thought leadership publications. Melissa, welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series, and you should now have control of the screen. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, again, thank you for the intro for not, not only myself, but what IRI does organization, um, you know, taking some of the largest data sets that exist, uh, you know, across purchase, consumer, media, causal, loyalty card data, et cetera, um, and bringing it together uh, in a way that's digestible for not only CPG manufacturers, but retailers. Um, and really the, the goal of all of that is to provide um, easy to consume understanding and insights to, to grow business, right? Whether you're a retailer, whether you're a manufacturer. Um, if you're kind of familiar with IRI at all, you maybe have heard about our recent merger with NPD. And the larger goal then is to take not only our data data sets, but then what NPD does and be able to understand end-to-end -end consumer behavior. Um, you know, we're, we're focused more on that in-home, but NPD brings us that out-of-home experience to understand uh, what consumers are doing, thinking, and how they shop, you know, across across food chain decisions, um, whether it's in-home or out-of-home. So uh, recent exciting merger happening and ongoing kind of as we speak. So uh, things will continue to evolve in that space. From today's point of view, though, we're all consumers and we're all really, uh, I think, feeling the pinch of inflation and what's just happening from a pricing perspective and how that's changing our shopping. Um, you know, when we think back to the last few years, so none of this is new to anyone. I think we're fully understanding because we're we living it, right? This is one area that's very different in terms of there are trends that maybe impact one facet of a consumer group or an age group or a different type of cohort. Um, COVID really impacted literally everyone, um, you know, age, age, population, region, you know, country, et cetera, alike. And so things that happened because of COVID we thought we were going to come out of it, and then we are hit with high, you know, record inflation um, and, and and pricing at the shelf and different different economic factors that are continuing some of those behaviors. And so, you know, we're continuing to eat at home more. Um, we are moving where we live. So from a U.S. perspective, right, moving into suburbs and different areas outside of city areas, we're shopping more online pre-COVID. Um, you know, supply 
constraints continue to impact certain categories. Uh, and then the high inflation uh, coupled with the fewer promotions. And so just these different things that are happening. And then you add on this layered impact of younger consumers starting to have a voice in the marketplace. And so uh, we've been talking about millennials for years, but now Gen Zs are starting to pop into the mix. And so what does that mean? And the juxtaposition of how a Gen Z shops versus a boomer, right? And so now we're spanning four-ish generation and lifestyle stages um, across, uh, you know, the, 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 the consumer base. And so how do you market to, you know, someone who's 20 versus someone that's 62? And so how can you bring all of them into the fold of your organization? And so when we're thinking about that too, that's just another factor layered onto things that we've seen because of, um, you know, COVID and continued the, the high inflation. Um, and when we think about that from the consumer lens, right, so we're here to kind of put that consumer nomenclature on it today, um, people are concerned, right? So IRI has the ability to survey consumers, and we've been doing this month over month, um, ongoing since before COVID, but it's become more important since then because we want the voice of the consumer overlaid with anything that we're seeing in the data. So when we look at it, right, almost all shoppers are uh, rating their current financial situation. I love this wording, less than excellent. I mean, I'm using the term, you know, less than ideal, but um, if excellent is the word we're going for, um, almost all consumers are really not feeling it right now. Um, and what does that mean then? Well, that means that they're going to continue to eat more at home. Um, in the world of poultry, they've actually noticed, and we specifically asked, and we'll get into some survey, uh, you know, question questionnaire results related to chicken. But people are noticing the pricing pinch. And when we specifically call out categories or ask them about specific categories or ask them to name them, chicken is one that they have noticed, um, you know, rising prices um, above other ones. I would say, too, right, we've noticed it in bacon and other areas, um, beef, et cetera, as well. So, so when we're noticing these sort of price pinching and penny pinching that has to happen on the home front due to lots of factors, and we'll get into some of those, what does that mean then? Well, it means that people aren't eating out as more, right? So 40% of consumers plan to eat, um, you know, to cut back on restaurant trips. And that includes fast casual. So even the value meals that we see, casual and certainly fine dining. And then it's even stemming to takeout, which we obviously saw a big rise of that during the pandemic. Um, but people are starting to back off of that. Part of that could be the fees associated with it, though, because those um, from a personal standpoint, seem to grow exponentially, um, you know, by the day. But but knowing that almost half of consumers plan to cut out restaurant or cut back on restaurant spending, um, you know, just shows sort of the the concern that consumers are feeling about their overall economic health. What's interesting, though, is that as we're looking at pricing inflation, inflation, excuse me. So we're able to track this all the way back, you know, like pre Great Recession from 2008. Um, at home consumption is actually seeing a higher spike of inflation rates compared to away from home and the pricing, uh, you know, metrics that we're tracking for those. What I would say, though, is that while the percentage for away from home is lower than the at home inflation, we know that purchasing food and eating at home is still cheaper than eating away from home majority of the time. So while we're seeing a higher increase, um, you know, at that at home, that away from home is obviously on a scale, you know, of absolute value is still much greater. Um, but this is why we're seeing that that trade off of people not being willing to to consume food away from home or that 40 percent. Um, of cutting back. So what does this mean from that consumer standpoint, right? So I'm going to walk you through a couple slides that um, are numbers heavy. And as Scott said, you'll get access to all this information. So you don't need to be tracking it diligently, um, but really, or looking at the numbers specifically. But what it's really telling us, though, is when you look at these numbers, right? So we've got edible, perimeter, and the non-edible, right? So all sort of your health and beauty type and, and, and items. Um, when you look at this trended from the beginning of 2020, um, so really kind of like pandemic start um, or, you know, just really two years of data, um, look at that average price. So uh, for those that can can see it, it's in blue and that average price increase. And I'm going to focus on the edible one at the top. We were seeing sort of that 
you know, average price increase happening at the beginning of 2020 versus the previous year, right around 3%, right? That's sort of the standard kegger, a standard inflation rate that we were seeing, like a cola, right? Um, dipped down a little bit as COVID came into the mix um, and then continued to sort of downslope. And we saw this premiumization kick in and that's where that orange 2.5 uh, starts to pop in. Um, but then look at the hold that that blue bar starts to take. So as early as probably August or September of 2021 is when we started. So, you know, literally a year ago, we started to see pricing slowly trickle up and people started to take note. We started getting more questions around our consumers noticing. Are they getting more sensitive? How is their elasticity playing out, right? Like their, their sensitivity. And what does that mean from like a mixed perspective? Are we seeing bigger pack sizes? Are we seeing premium offerings uh, go down? How's private label factoring in? All of that is part of that blue bar that at the end or where we're sitting today is an average price increase, you know, of about 15% with an edible. Um, perimeter showing similar trends, right? It's kind of doing a little bit of a slope, but if you look at it overall, it's still about 10% or 11%, excuse me, um, from a pricing perspective. And then non-edible is also seeing price increases. So if you're thinking of any uh, over-the-counter medications, health and beauty type items, um, you're, you're noticing the pinch there too. So it's really happening across the board, but really in food is where we're seeing those, you know, double double digit um, and, and beyond um, sort of increases. Hopefully that is switching fast, but we're breaking it down a little bit more and then looking just at that sort of price per volume that the previous slide was kind of looking at the mix and the juxtaposition between what's on shelf and how price correlates. This is really looking at sort of just the very standard, you know, what's happening at pri across pricing. So again, focusing kind of on that edible area, right? Because that's edible and perimeter, I would say we could look at um, for this conversation, but noticing, you know, those price increases that are happening across the board. Um, and this is versus literally the period right before it. So we're talking month over month. So the one before was showing that giant leap of, you know, 15%. That was comparing it to September and August of last year, right? So as prices started to creep up, this one is literally saying it just isn't stopping. And so when we look at sort of the area in the dotted line box, right, it's showing us that over time and starting in February of this year is when it just continued to hammer and hammer and add on. And so, you know, when you're talking a one to 2% price increase month over month over month, that's what this is telling us. At this highest level, those are the price increases that we're seeing. Um, when we look at it, you know, deeper on a category level, some of these numbers are double digit month over month, right? Just because we're playing catch up in certain areas, some categories tried to hold off on price increases and others, um, you know, really just took hits kind of one and done. Um, but continuing to see those prices, uh, you know, driving up and up. What's interesting to note is when we take that again, that sort of consumer lens, and in this case, we're going to do it from a household perspective, who is being most impacted? Um, I don't think it comes as any surprise that we're seeing lower income households be impacted by these price increases and by, you know, uh, paying higher costs for literally every good we have, rent, utilities, gas, et cetera. Um, but we're noticing it in these low income households are really starting to, to feel the pinch even more. What's interesting, though, is low income households were a big driver of growth during COVID. Part of that, I think, is from some of the government funding that came in, um, right? There were additional uh, additional funds available um, to those that met certain criteria. Um, and those funds, those funds have been pulled back. And then now we're being met with this higher, uh, you know, higher prices. So this sort of imperfect storm is really hitting these households. And when we look at like where it's hitting them from a category perspective and compare that to like high income households and where they're performing well, um, low income uh, from a category, fresh seafood, pricier meat, which I would argue is almost all meat at this point, and then snack foods, right? So things that they may um, view as a luxury to have, right? Like canned nuts, um, you know, peanuts, cashews, et cetera, that are approaching, um, you know, seven, eight dollars a pound, um, not being able to potentially purchase items like that. 
And then when we look at that again, we're looking at sort of the the, the actual store part of it um, trended back, right? So low income households really saw and contributed to growth um, during COVID. And then you can see how that is slowly, um, slowly declining and, and not even slowly declining. <laughs> it's actually declining at a much faster rate than sort of just the, the general, you know, store, I would say. So for all stores on that, on the right side. Um, so we're, again, we're seeing the lower income households be, be affected exponentially more, I would say, than sort of the average household. Um, and when we think about what that means for, I keep hitting the wrong button, so apologies if it's advancing too fast. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Okay. Um, we know that uh, promotions were pulled back, right? So during 2020 and 2021, whether it was just literally we didn't need to drive people to a shelf to purchase more, we didn't need them, we didn't need to offer BOGOs, and we didn't need to incent anyone to buy. And then you factor that with supply chain issues that people couldn't even make products to put on shelves. So why would we certainly be promoting them? Um, what we're noticing, though, is across key categories, because of these high inflationary times, um, we're starting to see sort of pre-COVID investment levels um, for certain areas of the store. And so, you know, when we're looking at it, looking at July is sort of the timing of that P722 and indexing it back to sort of the 2019 pre pre-pandemic and understanding, you know, where are we seeing um, the lift come back into play? So, you know, from a meat perspective, refrigerated meat and breakfast meats kind of in that upper third area, they're basically back to where they were pre-pandemic. They're not discounting any more than they were um, pre-pandemic, but they're starting to notice and recognize that they need to offset. And, you know, from a pricing perspective, these are the areas that have seen uh, and we'll get into some of the pricing details. This is where they've seen uh, price increases, you know, anywhere from 10 to 25 percent year over year. Um, certain areas like beverages really aren't starting to, to fully go back to where they were. Um, frozen entrees, appetizers, that type of thing, too. They're not either. And they don't have to, to be honest. They're increasing in price but they're also still very key categories, especially as at-home consumption stays high. So people are still willing to spend a little bit on certain areas. Um, but where we're not willing to spend as much is in this premium area. So during the pandemic, we saw premiumization sort of rise to the top, right? As people weren't um, eating out as much as they were, we weren't socializing, you know, we, we weren't doing much of anything, but we were sure we're willing to spend $12 on a block of cheese. And um, that home indulgence that people really enjoyed through the pandemic. And that was across all cohorts, by the way. That was across all generations. That was across any income. People were buying stuff, you know, better ice cream, better treats, better premium snack nuts. You name it, we were buying it. Um, and that really started to have... Um, have we, that started to be negatively impacted as these price increases have happened. So, you know, when you look at that sort of... Q2 timing of 2022 as prices have been going up, that's where you see that red in that top area start to come down. So premium players are being pinched during this time. Um, and it's just because people don't have the uh, disposable income, you know, and discretionary money to be able to spend. So mainstream is where it's at. Uh, value items are continuing to sort of crawl out of the area that they, um, you know, the downward slope that they were in. Part of that, it's not that we weren't buying value items during COVID, it's that we couldn't find them. So, you know, if you look at that last little uh, private label line, um, it's showing that private label suffered, um, you know, at a total level, I would say suffered, right? They dropped a little bit. But what they really started to notice was that during the pandemic, we couldn't even produce private label products, especially if it was a core manufacturer. They were making their own products and couldn't really get to keeping up with the demand to also create private label ones. So we saw a ton of out of stocks across private label. That is writing itself as much as it can. I think there's still lots of areas that are still on allocation. You know, if you've been reading anything, um, our butter resources are at an all time low, um, you know, historically. And so what does that look like? Um, um, you know, for private label in Q4, who knows? Um, but we're starting to see private label play a larger role again because A, they're on shelf and B, they're a more economical option from a pricing perspective. 
And when we look at that sort of at a deeper level, focusing on that private label area, um, this is really talking about private label. And so when you look at the share change, um, you know, and that's the sort of the orange and the green, it's gaining its footing back, right? It never went away because private label in general has some very high shares across key categories. And I would call them, you know, staple categories eggs, sugar, butter, uh, flour, etc. cetera. Um, they continue to sort of see the share growth come back into these staple areas where they maybe were um, losing some footing during the pandemic. Um, another area too that I find really interesting um, is that sort of other snacks, and that's a lot of like dried meat snacks and jerky snacks, private label um, is seeing some, some great growth. And then frozen appetizers, you know, snack rolls, mozzarella sticks, pizza rolls, all those sort of, um, you know, I would say uh, Gen Z and millennial food um, that seems to be uh, benefiting from just an uptick, but also uh, private label is gaining some traction. So some offerings from retailers are really, really driving some of that. But, you know, really just understanding that private label is having a large, um, a large showing. And it's interesting to see that given um, just how they performed over the pandemic because they couldn't be on shelf. Um that's also playing out, though, in what we're seeing from a from a retail perspective. So this is very high level, but it's looking in general at like, where are we shopping, right? Um, grocery stores reigned supreme and club did too during the pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, grocery actually rebounded because pre-pandemic, I would say grocery was actually suffering a little bit um, at the hands of some of the other, uh, the other channels. Um, but we're starting to see mass is playing a role again. And then um, club continues to sort of uh, see growth um, year over year. Um, they're down slightly in the last little 12 week um, bump, but it's really just because mass has uh, been been really driving a lot of the growth. Um, but we're shopping in those areas. It's interesting to me, though, that like dollar isn't up given sort of that the low income store area. Um, and that's something that we're watching intently just because we think um, that consumers will gravitate towards dollar in certain areas and certain income breaks. Um, as we continue, you know, through the holiday season, uh, we think that that'll be an area. Um, groceries by no means like not growing though, right? I think that that's important to note. It's losing, you know, share when we look at it compared to a year ago in 2021, but they're still growing at over 2%. So they're sort of growing at an, at a, at an almost average rate, we would say. And when we look at that just in general, like what do we think is going to happen, you know, given all of these puts and takes from a historical, you know, comparing it to the historical standpoint and where we think it's going. Well, we've got some thoughts um, and we already know and we've got, you know, information through. Well, gosh, on Monday, we now have IRI data through um, uh, October 2nd. Right. So we're, we've got the first nine months of the year already captured and, and about a year of this inflationary time. So we're able to really understand sort of what we think is going to happen. So we know that we're probably going to end 2022 around this inflationary, you know, dollar sales um, rate at about like 10 to 12. Um, our baseline or our average that we were seeing pre-pandemic because around that two to four, sort of just our standard, right, cola that we would say is, was happening across everything we bought. Um, and we're thinking that's going to end up somewhere in 2023, not as high as 2022, but certainly not as low as our baseline and what we saw before, right, that one to three percent range. We're going to see prices remain high at about seven to nine percent. And again, that, that's just average. There are some that might be lower than that. And we're starting to see that in some areas. Um, some sales are dropping off from a dollar's perspective, um, but others are still sort of, you know, really seeing those high, those high peaks. I think I looked at bacon data yesterday and price increases for bacon were still, you know, 16% versus year ago. So, um, so they're coming down because like, if we looked at that in July, they were actually up, you know, 24%. So while price increases are softening, they're by no means going back to where they were um, when we look across, you know, just total, total store. So what does that mean? Um, knowing that it's not going anywhere, right? At least for um, the, the next year, I would say. Um, ongoing inflation will continue to drive increasing reactivity and sensitivity to the things that we're doing at the shelf. So from a consumer standpoint, right? We saw that some of those categories were starting to show um, promotional activity back at pre-pandemic levels. What'll, what will be interesting and what will actually be really important for manufacturers and retailers alike is that um, 
we can't just drop the bottom out of the price, right? That does this, all sorts of things to the sensitivity sort of barometer. Um, what we need to do from a consumer standpoint is prioritize the frequency over the depth. So having smaller pockets of, um, you know, price decreases and promotions, but having them more frequently allows consumers to be able to come back into the fold of products um, more frequently rather than either buying it and stocking up when it's on a super deal or only being able to hit it once. But then when they come back on their next two to three shopping trips, it's not on deal. So they can't. They can't even buy it. Um, and that leads to the next point, right? Elasticity will continue to pick up. So consumers will begin to look for the deals. They will begin to understand where they can find them, how they can find them, and then further, right, what channels they will happen in. So retailers um, will continue to be competitive on pricing or they'll have to be um, or they're going to start to lose out. Um and then, um, you know, from an internal standpoint, those that are making the products will have to really understand what their cost ratios look like and where they're able to, um, you know, potentially cut costs. Although given this environment, um, we're just obviously seeing it more and more get passed on to the consumer. Uh, and how we're doing that from an IRI perspective is how, how are we helping clients do that, whether that's a, a manufacturer or a retailer, is we are really sitting down with them with the lowest granular data that we can, um, whether it's modeled or unmodeled, right, to be able to understand where are the correlations of, you know, some work we did of high gas prices compared to bacon prices or compared to where we were seeing different shifts from, from poultry pricing um, and understanding real time, you know, within a week's time, um, what needs to be done and what you can do to maximize the volume opportunity. Um, and then something I haven't talked about much uh, is that Omni Shopper. So back to, you know, consumers will start to learn and understand where can they make um, where can they find a better deal? Where can they, you know, note a price decrease uh, across retailers, across manufacturers? A lot of this is happening digitally. So they are literally able, and there's apps that do it. If you don't have one, I recommend getting one from just a tracking perspective. It will pull up for you what the average price is across, you know, the three key retailers in your area for a certain product and then further um, across competition. So when you're thinking about if your consumer is going to be buying your product or buying a product, um, there's a lot of things coming into play that can alert them, hey, it's actually on better deal over here. And so they're becoming more savvy in how they understand dealing. And so some of those decisions are happening um, you know, real time, but at the shelf, but also like in the digital fashion. So that can influence where they're shopping um, for sure. Uh, and that we're starting to see that too. So we're going to dive a little deeper into this impact on poultry. And this is actually misleading because as I was looking through the information, um, I'm not just talking about poultry here, but that's a key factor. But we're going to be looking at how these prices are happening, you know, across across all um, meat types. And so um, dollar sales are up, right? So when we're just talking core protein, beef, chicken, pork, turkey, dollar sales are up. When they're up, you know, three years ago, we're talking obviously exponentially um, uh, given, you know, just given pricing dynamics that have happened over the last three years. We look at it two years ago, continuing to grow. We look at it uh, versus year ago, for sure, continuing to grow. I think that's interesting to note the chicken one, right? Still hanging on to sort of that double digit growth. Um, others obviously are still seeing, you know, solid uh, price increases driving these dollar sales up. So what does that mean then for volume sales? Well, that means that volume sales are down. So some are still up compared to pre-pandemic levels, uh, i.e., you know, beef and chicken, but they're starting to see some lagging volume sales year over year um, just due to the high prices, right? Um, we'll get into some information in a minute, but uh, people are still buying these. It's just that they might be buying less because of the pricing that we're seeing, or they might be dabbling across some, some different types of things. But it hasn't changed the demand per se, right? People are still eating at home. So the volume declines that we're seeing in these areas are still soft in comparison, right, to, to some other areas. Um, when we look then at a deeper level, just focusing on chicken and what's happening within chicken cuts, again, um, pricing, right, up across the board. So you can kind of see how it's fluctuated over time. I do know, right, I believe uh, someone mentioned the other day, 
um, and this wasn't a personal conversation, was around, um, it seems that chicken prices are coming down. And they indeed are, right? Like if we look at a shorter time frame, they're starting to slowly kind of come down on a month over month basis. Um, and consumers are noticing. This was literally me having a conversation with friends and just picking their brain about what they were noticing at the grocery store. Um, what I also think is interesting, though, is that similar to what we saw on the core protein slide right before, uh, a lot of areas are continuing to see volume declines then, right? Total chicken down 2%, chicken breast down nearly 5.5%. Thighs, wings, and legs, except for wings just, light, just lightly down, continue to see um, to see some growth, though. You know, um, this is something that we just have seen pre-pandemic, or it's kind of leading into the pandemic, excuse me, um, and we're just continuing to see growth in these areas. And so when we think about why that is, we've got a couple hypotheses, right? So again, cuts can be different costs, although we know wings have been up um, crazy insane uh, prices year over year. Um, but think about how we're preparing things, right? So in our uh, new merger with NPD, we have access to how many people are buying grills, how many people are buying smokers, how many people now own air fryers. By the way, it's almost 80% of households um, own air fryers. Um, and so when you think about that, it opens the door to being able to prepare things differently, right? It's not just your crock pot. Um, it's not just your oven. And so having the ability to do some of these things um, has really changed people's openness to have different cuts of meat and certainly within chicken, right? I mean, air fryer, chicken wings, there's nothing better. Um, and then pulling back again, so from a poultry perspective again, right, and this is sort of a total poultry, you see the green, right? And so this is really just highlighting like the highest, right? So we know the price per volume on a percentage basis for poultry is um, increasing uh, higher compared to beef, pork, hot dogs, and sausage. So uh, what I will say, though, is we're going to get into some absolute numbers on the next slide, and that's where you start to see the differences. So um you know, chicken and beef. So volume is the blue line. Uh, the actual price per volume is that yellow or gold line. So, right, pricing going up, uh, volume trending down. But when you look at the absolute price, so you've got the $3 for chicken and you've got the over six bucks a pound for beef. This is where the difference is. So while the chicken exponentially on a percentage basis is growing from a price perspective, you know, increasing faster than say beef, the absolute price point is still nearly half of what beef is. And so we've been getting a lot of questions around, are people trading down, right? Are people, you know, whether it's a steak, are they going to a chicken breast? From ground beef, are they going to ground turkey? Those answers are yes. So as you see that huge slope down for beef, it's just slowly starting to rebound. And you can see it on the chicken side too. Um, the last couple months, you've seen an uptick, uh, a small uptick in volume sort of month over month. And that's where we're starting to see, um, right, the promotions have an impact or people are resetting their new normal expectations and they're understanding what, a, what the price is. And so they're able to factor that more into their shopping behavior. Um, we have the same information for both pork and turkey. Uh, pork prices continue to rise. Uh, pork has been seeing some success, though, in, in, in growth pockets um, across the board. It's actually ground pork is driving a lot of this, interestingly. Um, you know, and then bacon is actually rebounding um, nicely um, from um, from some levels of a couple months ago. Turkey is all over the place. I don't think that's any surprise. Um, there's also, you know, not only is there the seasonality impact, but the AI has obviously played a large role in what's available from a consumer standpoint. So what does all this mean as we're talking to consumers, right? So we talk to consumers, we're asking them um, just in general, like, hey, how are you feeling, right? We had that side at the beginning that said 95% of people um, are feeling less than excellent about their um, their sort of current financial state and what that means for the future. Um, so that's our current one. We asked, okay, so we know that, but what do you think about the future? Um, and what do you think about your expectations for your current or your future, excuse me, financial um, standpoint? Do you expect it to be better, worse, or about the same? And so what we heard was that um, some think it's going to be better. All but boomers are actually feeling optimistic. Highest scores um, are for Gen Z and millennials. Bless their optimism, right? And then um, on a weird cross cut that we did, what does that mean for people that are saying they want to buy more chicken? 
they are also feeling very optimistic. So if you take one thing away today, you can take away that chicken buyers are optimistic about their future financial situation, unless you're a boomer and then you're not. But what does that mean? So, right, we're talking to them specifically about like, hey, let's talk your let's talk your chicken habits. And so um, consumers are eating more chicken more often in the past six months. Ninety nine percent. They uh, you know say that they eat fresh chicken at least once a month. Um, a year ago, that was ninety six percent. So, I mean, we're already talking, you know, upper of the upper. Um, Eighty eight percent eat it more than once a week. And so why do they eat it? Well, it's healthy. It's versatile. And then um, they're continuing to buy more than they were before. But what they're buying can be changing, right? So some of these yellow areas, we're calling them sort of the trade downs. Um, and so what does that mean? You know, if they're buying less or buying um, some of the same amounts, well, we're seeing more people buy store brand chicken. Um, we're seeing the less number for organic and name brand kind of drive more, right? So some of those red lines and then the more expensive cuts. So you kind of can see the dovetail of like, in general, people are really focused on the less expensive cuts and any value size that they can find to offset some of the costs that we're seeing. Again, we know that some of the cost is changing um, for chicken, but it's still top of mind when people are, are you know, shopping at shelf. And then we asked them like, okay, we had 85% recognize that they were higher, you know, prices were higher for chicken than they were, um, you know, back in February a uh, month ago. Um, and we asked them why. Uh, we basically just said like, you know, why in your opinion is um, our chicken prices rising? And so, um, you know, this, this is, um, you know, I would say take this with a grain of salt, but it's interesting to note that um, energy and gas prices trumped the top of the list. And so when we're looking at that from a consumer lens, boomers and retirees think that and blame that for a lot of the other higher costs. Um, there's some more social ones happening with younger consumers. So if you look at you know, some of the yellow areas that are highlighted for, for Gen Z. Um, they think it's driven by the war in Ukraine, um, the concentration and market power of, you know, consolidated chicken companies, um, ethanol, and so different things like that. So it's just interesting to see um, from a consumer perspective what people think is actually driving, um, you know, the, the the cost of goods to go up. So, but uh, really the ones at the top are the higher energy prices, labor prices going up, and then just in general, right, um, a lot of consumers, 42%, assume that it's driven by the higher prices for, for, for feed. Um, so I thought that was interesting as well. All of that, though, consumers are still eating chicken, right? We saw 99% um, will continue to eat chicken. Um, when we talk about them, like from a center of plate standpoint, like how are you eating chicken? Um, 53%, it remains sort of the center of their plate. So it is sort of the key area and the key core protein that is sitting um, on their plate. 32% use it to make soup and 29% are using it to ro uh, just roast a whole chicken that is higher for Gen Z. And if you're on TikTok at all and understand the obsession that younger consumers have with Ina Gurton, she has a roast chicken recipe that took off on TikTok um, with with younger consumers. So um, it's a it's a tried and true recipe. But the fact that it has resonated and what is the opportunity? Right. We looked at whole bird prices were down significantly. Or excuse me, not prices. Prices were up. But volume was sort of kind of the, the naysayer within the category. What does that mean if we can get these consumers to drive whole bird uh, volume? Um, so just an interesting thing to think about. 24% um, of consumers say they're eating less meat in general, and that's actually lower for Gen Z and millennials, which I thought was very, just given the fact that, um, you know, we tend to think that younger consumers are maybe eating less meat um, than older, older counterparts and consumers. Um, we also ask consumers, you know, which of the following have become more important to you? And that was like a scale, right? They basically could rate a lot of these things. So what matters to them? Price and overall price and price per pound. I don't think that that's any surprise to any of us, just given, you know, the fact that we're consumers and we're in an industry. Um, what also is driving some of their, their importance is that value size or family pack. And so wanting to see those those larger uh, volume offerings to be able to offset some of that price per pound. And I think that that's where we're obviously seeing across the store and we're seeing club and, and um, map out of that. 
what matters less to them if it's organic or free range, right? When prices start to hit a threshold, consumers drop off of, of, of needing some of the things, um, you know, and that tends to be one of them. Um, name brand, right? So if it's a brand that they're familiar with, it's actually having less of an impact just given the prices that we're seeing. Um, and then if it's frozen, right? It just is sort of uh, less important than before. So when we think about that, we mentioned that 85% will consume more or the same amount of chicken, uh, fresh chicken, excuse me, in the next next six to 12 months. A third of that group, 33%, anticipate that they will eat more. And I talked about it earlier, but why are they going to? We asked them, right? What is your, what is the drive and the love of chicken? Well, it's healthier. It's perceived as healthier. It is healthier. They think it's a better value for the money. And when we looked at some of those absolute price points, we know for a fact that consumers are trading down from more expensive beef cuts to different chicken cuts. Um, and then just in general, people are going to eat at home, right? We know that 40% of people plan to cut back on their out-of-home food consumption and their restaurant consumption. So they'll be looking for more alternatives at home, and chicken plays a very large role in that. Um, interestingly, the consumers that said they were going to eat less chicken are just in general eating or planning on eating less meat. So it wasn't an affront on chicken by any means. It was literally just that they... Um, that they're taking a break from meat overall, likely cutting their consumption. When we think about that, that makes sense then, right? That um, again, you know, consumers plan to eat more from a protein perspective. So chicken, fish, and eggs are really the key drivers of where we see people saying, um, we're going to um, eat, be eating more. Um, we're going to be eating less on the flip side then, um, you know, over a third of, of consumers are saying they plan to eat less beef. Um, some of that is driven by health things. Some of that is driven by price things. And so it's kind of a combination. And then pork seeing that 22%. So, you know, if you're, if you're looking at where you want to be on here, um, right, chicken, fish, eggs, et cetera, are the areas that uh, consumer um, will really, will really start to start to drive that home. And then when we're thinking about it from a perspective of, okay, so if they're going to be buying it, but how can I get them to buy more, right? We already know prices are high, but some are softening. What can we do then from the perspective of um, getting consumers to just to potentially buy more? Well, one area is in adding value. And one area that IRI is going to have a heavy, heavy focus on. Um, we've always looked at sustainability, but this will continue to be an area that we think will drive consumer decisions. And that is across, uh, it's across demographics, right? It's across boomers, it's across millennials, it's across Gen Z, it's across income. And um, what's interesting, though, is that means different things to different generation, generations, excuse me. So uh, social do good acts and adding value and sustainability things are different and different definitions than they are for a boomer. But in general, what do people want to do? And what are they focused on across this? Like simple language that they can read, that they can understand. Um, the company reputation as a whole matters to consumers, right? It matters in general at 82%, but then it matters even more for the people that are actually going to be buying more chicken, up to 91%. Animal welfare remains top of mind. Um, packaging waste remains top of mind. Is it locally sourced? And what we're continuing to see, and you can see in some of those over here, are calling it out on your packaging in a way that consumers can understand. We're also seeing um, that back one is actually a, an example from New Zealand and it's a QR code and you can trace the net carbon footprint. Um, and, and in this case, silver print is actually net carbon zero. And so just an interesting way to think about, we talked a little bit about, you know, the digital um, aspect and how consumers can shop and play for pricing and promotions. It will become even more apparent and critical as we think about, um, you know, consumers being able to have access to transparency and sustainability and how that factors in across um, across products and companies. And last little piece, I, we already talked about it again, right? But just the whole where we'll be eating. We know that 40 percent of consumers will continue uh, will will be cutting back, excuse me, on their um, eating out. And that's across fast food, casual, as well as fine dining. So um, just the areas will continue to be driving um, consumers to eat at home.
And so when we think about that, right, like where are they going to do it? Uh, 57%, right, will be eating more at home. And I think that's that just really speaks to the opportunity um, that exists for um, driving sales, even in times of high inflation. And it's really just about how you're going to speak to consumers. How can you incent consumers without, you know, give, giving away the farm? And how can you continue to um, cater to the generations uh, that continue to grow in prominence um, across, you know, the consumer spectrum? So with that, I, uh, I, I thank everybody for their time today. All right. Very well. Thank you very much, Melissa. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. As the global leader in choline, Balchem has spent more than 50 years perfecting the art and science of choline chloride production. The new Puricol line delivers the highest standards of quality, produced in state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities, and backed by the strictest process controls for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you can't find anywhere else. Turn to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem for an unmatched level of quality you can trust. Visit balchemanh.com to learn more. All right. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Um, Melissa, it, it's obvious that uh, the, the food industry has been hit hard with inflation. It doesn't look like that's going to be abating anytime soon. I'm curious if consumers have an understanding of the root causes of those changes. And, and do we anticipate that may reflect itself in the ballot box here next month? Yeah, I so I would say, you know, when we ask consumers in general about what they think from like what's driving prices, um, you, you kind of saw the list across the board, right? It was over 50 percent said that it was really just because of high energy and gas prices. And for those of us in the industry, we know that that is only one layer to the issue. So I would say they get it on a macro level, um, but not not the, the minutia of the details, right? They don't understand. Um, what they do understand though, and what they're actually aggravated about is that they feel that it's being passed on to them. And they feel that companies aren't doing their best to sort of mitigate passing that on to the consumer. Um, we've heard a lot of that sort of angst coming across like of, around manufacturers and retailers. Um, knowing what we know about consumers and how they answered a lot of those, you know, what are the thing, what are the key things? I think that will be a very key political message. And I think we've already started to hear it. We're like, Hey, I beat inflation last month or, you know, I brought it down. And so those will be key. I think ballot that we start to see people talking about um, is what we're going to do to combat inflation. And I mean, I've already seen it locally, right? Talking about reckless spending and what does that mean for inflation? And so I think it'll be a very key part of, um, of kind of political communication. All right. Very well. Um, most of our audience is in the uh, animal protein business and one of our competitors is, is plant protein. Kind of curious if you have a feel for what have um, plant-based proteins um, done relative to uh, animal-based proteins? Yeah, so um, we, uh, I have great research that I'm happy to share with you guys um, if you want to post it as sort of a secondary hand out um, a plant-based trends deck that talks, you know, just in general across the store, primarily plant-based still exists in the dairy space. So when we think about, um, you know, share wise, it's in meat, but it's nowhere near the level that it is across dairy. And so um, what we're also seeing though, is as prices have ticked up um, that they're not doing as well as they potentially were in the past. So um, I think there's a couple reasons for that. Consumers are um, looking for more transparency, right? We're looking for more health-oriented options and ingredient decks of plant-based items, um, especially in the meat area, are, are lengthy to say the least. And so um, we've talked to a lot of consumers about that and, you know, having 32 ingredients for a, for a plant-based patty um, is, is really starting to register and resonate with consumers. Um, so when we 
ask people like, what are they going to do from a protein perspective? We still had about a third of people say they're going to buy the meat alternatives, but a lot of people were going to look for sort of natural sources of protein. So, you know, my head's thinking it, it's, it's more sort of the legumes and beans and those types of things that uh, people will be using. Um, but they're still there and they're still growing, um, but, but they're seeing the same pricing crunch that everybody is. So when you're trading off, will you spend $10 or $6, right? So that's sort of what we're starting to see. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Zachary would like to know, has there been a shift back to commercially sourced products from local or farmer uh, markets? Um, and let's see if they gained a lot of popularity that gained a lot of popularity during COVID. And do you see this trend continuing or shifting going forward? Um, we haven't seen it slow down from, I think there's been a slight shift, but we haven't seen the farmer's market and local phenomenon slow down by any means. And part of that is because there's this assumption that because it's closer, it's still cheaper, right? There doesn't, it, when we know that 51% of consumers think that rising energy and transportation and gas costs and labor costs are driving food prices up. Um, they're assuming if they get it from their local farm that they're, they're saving money somehow. Um, so it's still something that we're seeing and what is actually happening. And I won't, I won't rabbit hole too much on it, but it's really something that's been interesting is there are now digital farmers markets where you can actually see your local ones and what they have offered for the day. So that if it's not even a farmer's market, but it's potentially a roadside stand that you can go to, you'll know exactly what they have available for you. And so when we're thinking of people doing that on a retailer perspective and shopping price, they can do it at now a local granular level. So it's, I think, going to get real interesting. Um, but, but we're not seeing it stop. Okay. So you use the word as people assume that it's less expensive. Is that not in fact, fact? Well, you know, we don't have a ton of data around like pricing at farmer's markets just because it's sort of not in our data set. Um, so that's a really good question. I think it's more just a perception. You know, if I think of it from a personal standpoint, um, I think it's really just a perception at this point. All right. Very well. Dr. Jim Aldrich is asking, historically, we've been told that U.S. consumers spend a lower percent of their income on food than most, if not all other countries. Is this still true? And how has that percentage changed in recent inflationary times? Um, that is a great question. I don't know um, if it's still holding true across the board. Um, those are I can certainly ask our NPD counterparts because they would be able to understand the total food spend. So I will absolutely take that as a follow up. All right. Sounds good. Um, has there been a shift back to. Nope. Sorry. Asked that one already. Uh, what, what are the key drivers? And maybe you've addressed this already, but the key drivers behind the inflation in food costs. And when do you anticipate seeing a reversal in these trends? Yeah. So, um, you know, we speak to a lot of manufacturers and so um, and, and a lot live in the commodity space. And so when you think about from a feed perspective, um, you know, dairy, meat, et cetera, uh, what we have heard and this sort of became part of the conversation last summer was that we dug out of the supply chain issues, you know, and, and we're still I wouldn't even say we've dug out. Right. There are lots of areas that are still um, impacted from supply chain. Um but there was enough offset in internal cost that the, a lot of it didn't need to be passed on to the consumers. But as the tide rose, you know, right, like all all tides rise and all boats rise, or whatever the whatever the cool saying is, it started to be an impact across the board. So with every line item of you know a manufacturer's budget and cost of goods rising at the same time, there we finally hit a point where there wasn't like a put or a take that could happen. Um, and so we had lots of conversations with manufacturers about we are finally having to price, you know, pass this on to our consumers. Um, and then what we found, you, you layer that in. So then manufacturers have to do that because they, they have to recoup these costs. Right. Um, and they can no longer offset it with margin. And then they may pass it off. But then what happens is that then it's the retailer adds the second layer, right? Just because a manufacturer raises price doesn't mean that the retailer is, is following that rule book to the T, right? So that's where we're seeing some of the play happen is that 
if a manufacturer does it, a retailer may still try and offset it in some certain way from a margin perspective or take their own margin. Um, and so that's why it's just this really weird storm of, of you know, price increases. We think it's certainly going to continue through 2023. Um, 2024 is a big election year, right? I mean, we're in one kind of, you know, regionally now for a lot of areas, but that's the big one. And so I think that's where it will get really interesting. Um, will we see relief? I don't, I mean, probably, right? Election years are their own anomaly. Um, so I think that could get really interesting after 2023. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that's a bit unpredictable as you're looking into your crystal ball is, and obviously has an impact on on food prices is the war in Russia and the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, you maybe what kind of impact it has and what's your current thinking on on that? Yeah, so we've been talking a lot with some of our, so IRI is a global organization, and we've been talking to a lot of our counterparts um, in Europe. And so, you know, when we talk about it, uh, the term that comes to mind is black swan. And so it's really um, the impact that that is having on supply chain, um, you know, fuel supply chain, and just in general, um, it is playing a role, right? And we saw that consumers recognize that not as much as just sort of our inherent, you know, price increases and labor increases, or labor cost increases. Um, but it is really having an impact on what we're seeing, um, just from really the the supply chain. It's just it's just putting a, a damper on the supply chain. Um, and, and that's happening globally that we're, we're certainly seeing. So I've got some really good information I can share on that, too, um, that's got a lot of the specific numbers behind it. So I'm happy to share that. All right. Sounds good. Uh, next question comes in from Kimberly. Uh, food choices and specialty products such as soda flavors and line extensions seem to have gone away during the pandemic as manufacturers focus on supplying their core products. Do you see this coming back? Um, I do. So my personal example is Fresca stopped being created so that Coca-Cola, right? So that just straight up red Coke cans could, could be on shelf um, as a Fresca drinker. It's happy. I'm very happy to see Fresca back on shelves. Um, yes. So we have seen a lot of um, flavor innovation tick back up in 2022, um, right? Innovation in general sort of halted during 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, there wasn't room for it on shelves and people didn't have the capacity to make it. Um, as we're talking to our clients, they are really looking at what their three to five year innovation plan looks like. And, um, a lot of it, I will say, falls into the line extension. So it's sort of the low risk, you know, kind of mitigated putting it out there, given that we're still dealing with high prices, maybe supply chain issues, et cetera. So it's sort of the closer in innovation that we're going to see a lot of in the next three to five years. So I flavor definitely and variety uh, plays a role in that. All right. Thank you, Melissa. We are now at the top of the hour. So we've got time. One more question. Sure. Um, so we saw that animal protein consumption increased during the COVID uh, period when we were all at home. We've now seen that decline, although it's not declined all the way back to the pre-pandemic levels. Um, so what's, what's going on? Are people eating less protein or are those proteins being displaced by non-animal proteins? Yep. Yep. I think it's both. So um, people are not necessarily wanting to eat less of it. I mean, we just see, right, that's, there's that tiny pocket of people that intend to eat less meat and it's really more beef driven than it is poultry driven. Um, but I think that there's, there's, there's an, it's happening because of pack size going down, right? So in order to offset costs, we're seeing pack size go down. So we're losing a couple ounces. And so when we talk about like a price per pound, um, it's not even a pound anymore that's being sold, right? It could be 13 or 14 ounces. And so that is having an impact. And then you take into account the value package seeking, the family size, the value pack. And so um, people are buying it in larger pack sizes, but buying it less often, if that makes any sense, right? So mm -hmm. they're going and they're getting the big one because it's cheaper. Um, and that might mean that they're missing out on their purchase cycle or the next purchase occasion that they would be doing. The other thing that we are seeing though, which I find really interesting is that um, in the past year, well, 
it started during during the pandemic, right? Staple items. So shelf stable pasta, beans, you know, canned vegetables, um, really more in the in the bean area. Um, we're continuing to see that. Like it sort of softened, right? As people kind of stopped doing this pantry stocking that they were doing. But now we're seeing staple items, rice, pasta, beans, especially. It's really being driven by beans, which when you think of from a protein source, right? That that's a that's a key um, non-animal one. Um because of the cost and it's actually dried ones. It's not even canned ones. So we're talking, you know, five pound bags of beans um, that are really seeing an uptick in uptick in sales. I think like 12% over last year. It's, I mean, it's some, it's some crazy high number and that's volume or volume in units. And so when you look at, you know, on an animal protein side, we're seeing a lot of volume softness. Like I haven't done specific work to understand, but we do know right, with those type of staple protein items or non-animal ones growing, that there's likely some trade-off happening um, in certain households. Very well. Well, thank you for that. This has been a very interesting conversation. I really appreciate the webinar today. I'm Melissa. I also want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of webinars will be very busy this fall with three more webinars in the next two months. On October 18th, uh, you can access a special four-speaker ruminant mini-symposia held in conjunction with the Cornell Nutrition Conference. We welcome Dr. Heather White, Dr. Mike Van Amberg, Dr. Barry Bradford, and Dr. Jose Santos to reveal the new revelations in transition cow nutrition. Dr. Jose Santos will also be back on November 1st to discuss the interaction between the implications of peripartum nutrition, health, and reproduction. And finally, join us on November 15th when we welcome back Dr. Dr. Temple Grandin to share insights into animal behavior and autism. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform or visit balchem.com slash podcast. With more than over uh, 50 episodes, you can listen to a wide range of topics. If you want a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just to subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address to anh.marketing at balchem.com, and we'll get that off to you as soon as possible. On behalf of Balchem and Ms. Rodriguez, thank you for joining us today. <music>